Esto es Informe Especial. Buenas tardes, le damos la bienvenida a una transmisión especial y exclusiva de Eco News, donde hablaremos sobre un tema que puede pasar desapercibido en nuestras agendas diarias, pero definitivamente ha tomado mucho auge a nivel internacional y se trata del antisemitismo. Para eso tenemos hoy un invitado muy especial, quien es el señor Aaron Kayak, él es el enviado especial de la Oficina de Control y Monitoreo en Contra del Antisemitismo. Es designado especial desde Washington y se encuentra aquí con nosotros. It is so nice to have you here in our studios. Mr. Aaron, if we can start maybe, what brings you here to Panama? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, uh, Panama has a very significant Jewish population and a government that uh, takes the fight against anti-Semitism very seriously. Uh, it's one of the few countries in the region who have adopted uh, the gold standard of definitions of anti-Semitism, the IRA definition, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, and so that Panama understanding what anti-Semitism is and showing to the region, but also to the world, um, that it takes anti-Semitism seriously. So uh, we're here to say thank you for that, and how can we work more together, government to government, but also civil society to civil society, uh, to ensure that we best combat anti-Semitism both here in the region, but also worldwide. Um, we are obviously related due to our lines of jobs to what is anti-Semitism, but maybe you can help us explain our audience because it's sometimes a term that it can be, you know, it has a misconception and a bad alliance to it, but we want to change that, right? Sure, of course. Just like any other form of hate or discrimination, attacking a Jew or disparaging a Jew just because they're Jewish is anti-Semitism. And when, you're, when a Jew is walking down the street of Brooklyn or Paris uh, or Buenos Aires and they are targeted uh, because they're visibly Jewish, uh, they're you know, punched in the face or you spit on them, that's, that's obviously uh, anti-Semitic when you're being targeted for who you are. That's a form of discrimination. When you're being targeted for being Jewish, that's anti-Semitism. I think where sometimes um, people uh, get confused is is when criticism of Israel, even harsh criticism of Israel, uh, veers into anti-Semitism. So for example, what we saw after October 7th was just a tsunami in the rise of anti-Semitism. It's important to remember, though, that in the aftermath of October 7th, anti-Semites themselves used the flag of, anti of, of criticizing Israel to peddle in their anti-Semitism. Um, you know, there's the song, Hater's Gonna Hate, right? And so they're just going to do what they do. Um, Now, there are some individuals who would harshly criticize Israel and that might veer into anti-Semitism or a gray area. But the bottom line is when you're targeting Jews collectively for the actions of the Israeli government, or by the way, any government for that matter, that's anti-Semitic. Um, for example, uh, my colleagues and I, uh, who have accompanied me, uh, work in the State Department. Uh, we work in the headquarters for the... Uh, how the United States makes diplomacy, and we have to go through protests sometimes to get to our offices. It's, 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 it's unpleasant. I have friends who work at the White House who have to go to different entrances uh, in the White House because they're blocked by protesters. But of course, that's a legitimate form of protest. We are the ones making or implementing the policies with which dis they disagree. But I also live in downtown Washington, D.C. I go to synagogue in downtown Washington, D.C. And we are a community now Um, that have to, had to fortify our synagogue. Uh, we had to create vehicle barriers to stop a second attempted car ramming. Uh, we also have uh, protesters who will come yell uh, insults at us as we're just on a Saturday morning, as a father's just trying to bring his seven-year-old daughter to morning services. That's not criticism of Israel, that's anti-Semitism. And if you would just take it out of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Um, you know, let's say you disagreed with the way a certain country was uh, dealing with its human rights record. Let's say you ha happen to disagree with how China treats its Uyghurs one way or another. It would be inconceivable to go protest in front of a Chinese restaurant because you disagree with the policies of the Chinese government. But yet, because it's such an ancient hatred, the the simmering underneath the surface of anti-Semitism, it's just all too comfortable for either purposeful anti-Semites or people who are just 
unconsciously anti-Semitic and, um, and falling into those anti-Semitic traps. Yeah, that's actually the last part that you mentioned is something that I actually wanted to talk to you and tell you. Um, I was going to ask you for some examples of how anti-Semitism is lived every single day, but you have told me already. And you, we can say you are in a, um, an office uh, position, so we can imagine how it can be to people in their daily lives. So I, was, I wanted to ask you, when you say policies, do we have a reference, a certain law, and I don't think that's the word, but if you have like a guidance on how to treat these different acts when they happen, I bet in the United States and also outside. Of course. First and foremost, it tar starts with governments and other actors just agreeing to take anti-Semitism seriously, um, not dehumanizing Jews or attacks against Jews. Uh, past July, on the 30th anniversary of the EMEA bombing uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, the United States, along with dozens of our allies, launched something called the Global Guidelines to Combat Anti-Semitism. It's now been signed by over uh, 40 countries and multilateral organizations. It's 12 simple uh, set of policy recommendations to governments, but also civil society and others, on how to take anti-Semitism seriously. It's so basic. When you see it, call it out. Uh, educate about it. Uh, you know, be cognizant of, of anti-Semitism online. Define it. If we could just show that we treat Jews in our society like we treat any other religious or ethnic or cultural minority and protect them as governments just like we would anyone else, that would go a long way. Thank you very much, Mr. Aaron. So, como pueden ver, no se trata solamente de hablar en contra del de odio y el antisemitismo. El odio es una palabra que va intrínseca en lo que es la lucha contra este flagelo. Y bueno, nos ha mencionado, como pudieron escuchar, que sí hay parámetros bajo los cuales la sociedad puede denunciar estos diferentes tipos de antisemitismo, pero todavía tenemos pendientes muchos temas de esta problemática como la influencia de las redes sociales y sobre todo preguntar también acá a nuestro invitado especial cómo se vive el antisemitismo o la respuesta de la comunidad judía en nuestro país. Por ahora vamos a ir a una parte comercial y regresamos con más. En breve regresamos con Informe Especial. Gracias por acompañarnos. Seguimos acá con nuestro invitado especial hoy, el señor Aaron Kayak, quien es el enviado para de la Oficina de Control y Monitoreo contra el Antisemitismo. Hemos explicado ya un poco sobre qué es este flagelo. So, ahora vamos a hablar un poco de cómo se identifica y cómo se vive en nuestras regiones. Mr. Aaron, now that we have understood a little bit about what anti-Semitism is and also how we can help to spread what it is, I wanted to ask you in your travels in it, that you have done as uh, diplomacy missions, what can you tell us about the, um, the, you know, the sharing of experiences between different religious groups for example, the Jewish community is very big here in Panama, but we also have other ethnicities, other religions that conclude in here. So how is that, you know, that relationship that you have found, if you can talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, first of all, you can't fight hate in silos, including with anti-Semitism. Once you're able to dehumanize one person in front of you for whatever reason, um, it, it doesn't, it's not going to be confined to that group because you're taking someone with their unique humanness, uh, some say God-given uh, humanness, it, but once you're able to take it away from them, it just goes to the next group. Uh, the, the thing about genocides and mass murders is they don't start with the gas chambers or with the machetes or mass graves, they start with words because you have to dehumanize the person in front of you to commit a genocide or when atrocities are even possible because if you if the person in front of you has their own human uniqueness, there's no way that you can commit those sorts of atrocities. And so what we've seen in our travels around the world is that when one hate is allowed to foster, it leads to others. Uh, one of the 
events that brought us to this larger region was the, actually the 28th anniversary of the EMEA bombing. I talked about the 30th. But I, it, the EMEA bombing uh, 30 years ago uh, against a Jewish cultural center in Buenos Aires um, is an example of both how horrific anti-Semitic attacks are and that they can happen anywhere in the world, but also that they impact all of society. Uh, the uh, Argentinians are still feeling um, the aftermath of the EMEA bombing. And at the time, it was the deadliest anti-Semitic attack since the Holocaust. Sadly, now it's the second most uh, because of October 7th. What we have in this region, though, especially with countries um, like Argentina and like Panama, are countries that could be leaders on a regional level, but also on an international level. It is not just Europe who has the responsibility or the Middle East who have the responsibility to speak out against anti-Semitism. We all do. And after October 7, we're living now in a reality that there's social media and mostly disinformation, you know, it is colluding the social networks. And after October 7, sadly, we are, I could say, from my point of view, seeing a rise in anti-Semitism. So we could say it's a different form of this hatred. So what can you give us as an opportunity to attack that? Do you see maybe um, ways that we can control that? Well, first of all, social media companies, at the very least, have to lift up to the own standards they set for themselves, their own terms of use. And we see too many companies not doing that. So they need to do better. But also, while it is a technological problem, uh, it, 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 fundamentally, it's a human problem. Anti-Semitism is known as the world's oldest hatred. And if you go throughout history and see when there's a technological advance, uh, for example, if we go back to the invention of the printing press, you, know, you could have been a preacher and preached to your congregation and you can spew your hatred. Maybe it'll impact them, maybe it'll impact the town, but not beyond that. Now with the advent of the printing press, you could have regional and eventually global reach, but it took time. Then if you fast forward to the invention of the radio, you see a figure like Father Coughlin, who even by today's standards, the percentage of listeners that he had uh, were remarkable, and so he was able to have reach that would have been previously uh, unheard of. And then if you fast forward to the time of social media, now some anti-Semite in their basement, sitting in the dark with an internet connection, could, could send out the right social media post that then gets picked up by a social media influencer and impacts millions. Before social media, that sort of hate would have died in the basement at, in the mind of that anti-Semite, or maybe they shared with a few of their uh, fellow anti-Semites, but the, uh, the ability now and the, the low entry, the low barrier to entry for a random anti-Semite sitting in their basement having worldwide reach uh, just wasn't even conceivable before. Yeah, I think it is a very huge uh, problem trying to control it because not even ourselves can control what we receive and what we receive currently in this social media. So. I wanted to ask you um, more specifically, um, how do you think, how has been the work with, for example, Panama throughout the years in this fight against anti-Semitism? What can you tell me about the experiences, if there's something that you want to point out? Sure. Um, well, like I said, Panama has been a leader, especially when it comes to uh, defining what anti-Semitism is. Uh, I am going to continue to engage with uh, your government in the coming days uh, to talk more about how we can work together. I just came from Costa Rica and Guatemala where we spoke with governments and local Jewish leaders and civil society on how the United States can partner with them as governments, with Panama as a government, but also just regionally to address this hatred. Fundamentally, any society that harbors such hatred and that has anti-Semitism in it is a threatened society. It's it has a destabilizing force, especially in democracies. Because if you buy into the anti-Semitic conspiracy myth that Jews are behind the media, that Jews are behind the financial systems, that Jews are behind your government leaders, if you really buy into that, you fundamentally lose faith that you're in control of your own life or that you can hold your leaders accountable. And then when you, when you feel like you don't have control and your government is account, accountable to this other, this nefarious actor behind the scenes, then 
the worst as possible. Thank you, Mr. Aaron. And I think that there is going to be especially a lot of you know, expectations towards this new administration. We are going to have how it's going to be, its policies. I think maybe we can talk a little bit more about that when we come back. Um, por ahora hemos seguido compartiendo con el señor Aaron Kayak y hemos abordado la posibilidad de trabajar con autoridades panameñas para ayudar en la lucha contra el antisemitismo y sobre todo cómo las redes sociales han preesperado, han postergado este gran debate sobre lo que es el antisemitismo, sobre todo en América. Así que es lo que vamos a conversar más adelante en el siguiente bloque con nuestro enviado especial. Usted quédese y seguimos con más de Econews. En breve regresamos con Informe Especial. Estamos de vuelta en esta entrevista especial con el enviado especial, valga la redundancia, Aaron Kayak de la oficina del monitoreo y contra el antisemitismo. Hemos hablado sobre este flagelo en Estados Unidos. Ahora vamos a convertir un poco sobre la importancia geopolítica. Mr. Aaron, we unfortunately uh, are going through a change. I mean, I mean, not unfortunately because, you know, changes, we have to see what happens. But there is definitely a political figure that is now going to be the future president that has talked a lot about something that I think definitely has, uh, in a bad way, contributed to anti-Semitism. So what can the State Department or your office, which works directly with this, what can we expect or what, what do you think about the new uh, administration? Sure. So I'm, I'm confident that President-elect Trump uh, and his administration will uh, make uh, combating international anti-Semitism, a leading priority in their administration, and that they will support the work and appoint uh, an ambassador to head our office, nominate an ambassador to head our office, uh, who will continue the work that we've done. Uh, when our office was created in 2004, 20 years ago, it was created on a bipartisan basis, and our office has enjoyed, over the, over the past 20 years, increasing uh, amounts of funding on a bipartisan level, and we have strong bicameral, so the Senate and the House, uh, and bipartisan support for our office. So when we engage in our work, regardless of who the president is, and we'll certainly continue uh, with the next administration, uh, we'll do so on a bipartisan basis. Because fundamentally, uh, it's an American priority to combat anti-Semitism. This is not the priority of any one individual. Uh, and the work of our office will continue, uh, not to mention the fact that we have a strong backbone of uh, professional diplomats in our office. There are about 20 members of our team. Uh, there's only a couple of political appointees. Uh, so in all likelihood, I'll be looking for a new job on January 21st, but the work of our office will continue. Some of the members of our office who you interacted with uh, will be the same people you would interact with uh, in the next administration. Uh, I, I know that they're going to take their job seriously and that uh, the direction from the White House will be uh, that what our office does will be a top priority for the United States. Now, um, maybe we can explore a little bit more about your actions when you come to these countries. Is it uh, more only on a teaching level, if there are any other activities? Like, for example, I can tell you our recent recently appointed mayor, he is, he is Jewish, I don't know if you've heard about him, and he is very um, moving in the social media scene. Uh -huh. So do you think maybe those kind of things, like in a positive level, could help overall with the fight against anti-Semitism? Well, there's plenty of uh, items to discuss that are positive. Uh, I'll be meeting with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I'll be meeting with your ombudsman, I'll be visiting the uh, Museum of Human Rights, I will also be engaging in a roundtable with civil society and, of course, with local Jewish leaders. So uh, you were asking me if I had any opportunity to explore the country, but um, our team packs our schedules so much because there's so much to talk about. Uh, and, but whether it's government to government or engaging with the local Jewish community or engaging with civil society or interfaith leaders, uh, these, these trips are too short because we can really spend uh, our entire time in office in just one region and oftentimes in just one country, but you know, there's, there's a large world out there and unfortunately the problem of anti-Semitism 
uh, is not limited to any one country or region. Uh, it's really a problem everywhere. And when you do these trips, can you tell me about the general uh, feedback you get from people, you know, for going over and speaking up against, you know, it's uh, a situation so important as anti-Semitism. What is some of the findings that you get, you know, from let's, let's call, you know, the social society, like what can you get from them when you do this uh, sort of um, teaching? Sure. So some of it involves teaching. Uh, like you asked about earlier, the nuances of what is anti-Semitic and what isn't sometimes involves some education. And look, government officials have a lot to deal with. People are busy in their just getting along in their lives. Uh, so sometimes I come uh, to governments and to uh, local communities to talk about what anti-Semitism is and what it isn't. Uh, other times, it's, it's how we can work together. So I'm looking forward to meeting, for example, with your Ministry of Foreign Affairs on how we can uh, buttress our shared values of fighting anti-Semitism and working more together, the United States with Panama or the United States of Panama regionally. Um, it's also learning from the local community. Obviously, the Jewish community throughout the world is a broad range of diversity, um, whether it comes to religious practice or whether it comes to how you interact uh, with your government. Uh, so in each particular place that we go, there are unique factors and unique ways that the United States can engage for good. Uh, and look, not all governments are as supportive as Panama when it comes to the fight against anti-Semitism. So sometimes the conversations are tough. But the thing about being the United States when we go to visit another country, and of course this is not a problem in Panama because we see eye to eye on this issue, but we, we can't be ignored. And so if we say uh, that anti-Semitism is a foreign policy priority for our government. Um, you can't just say we disagree because we have, uh, we have so many other interests that we deal with on a bilateral, multilateral space that it's your problem if you don't take anti-Semitism seriously. Yeah, there's definitely, from what you've told me, I can understand there is a big, big effort coming. Not only, I would say, from the United States, but it's just a um, compound effort to, you know, to combat anti-Semitism. And I have to say it because I follow the news. I really appreciate your time here and you coming over to speaking to us so we can tell the Panamanian society about what anti-Semitism is because like I told you, I think social media has kind of changed a lot about that discourse. But also just say, how do you think perhaps in a few words, because we are about to finish, sadly we have a few times, outcomes uh, for the Jewish community uh, regards uh, current situations? Well, I think it's an all society approach. So governments have to take it seriously. Local government leaders have to take it seriously. But what you're doing here with sharing your, uh, your wide ranging and wide reaching media platform, uh, the, the perch that you have in uh, raising this issue as important, that it go out to all your viewers and all your social media followers, uh, that, that goes a long way. Because it's one thing for somebody to come to a lecture that I'm giving at a Holocaust museum. They know what they're getting. They choose themselves. But maybe somebody watches this program or follows you on social media, and they learn something maybe they didn't know before. Thank you so much, Mr. Aaron, and your team that made this interview possible. We really appreciate to have you here. Y a todos los que nos acompañaron desde casa, les agradecemos por a acompañarnos a debatir, a abordar este tema tan importante, esta problemática del antisemitismo, no solo en América, sino también en el mundo. Eso es todo por ahora. Los espero pronto para una entrega especial de mi parte en las internacionales y ahora seguimos con nuestra programación regular. Esto fue Informe Especial.